Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our very first student town hall. This town hall was created to provide a little bit more transparency about the university's COVID-19 policy and responses and gives us students the opportunity as well as the channel to ask questions and get them answered. Tonight, we have two very special guests that will help us answer these questions that were asked by students. A call for questions was called out last week and we received a number of responses and thank you for all those that submitted your question. If your question didn't get answered tonight, don't worry, we'll have many more to come. So keep answering those questions, asking those questions. For tonight, we have Vice President of Student Affairs, Aaron Hoffman Harding and Vice President for Campus Safety and University Operations, Mike Seaman. Thank you guys for joining us tonight. Thanks, Ellie. Good to be here. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Maybe. Ellie. It's nice to see you tonight. Yeah. Um, Ellie, I, I think tonight is perfect timing to have this first session, right? We're in our first week of class. Um, things are getting underway. So looking forward to hearing the questions and, and reacting to them and answering them the best we can. I think it's great timing for that. Um, if you're paying attention to our dashboard, um, today was noticeably different than the last seven days, last five days, and we where we saw an uptick um, in positive cases from yesterday, um, posted at noon. So that's got our attention, and that's that's serious. Uh, we've been trending for the last week of having maybe six and a half to seven positive cases a day. We had 29 yesterday, so there's something going on. So I'm hoping that the questions that we hear tonight, we Aaron and I, we can address it and maybe add some context as we go. But I think it's a great reminder, so it's so well positioned that we're here together tonight to talk a little bit about the semester and what's on your guys' mind. I agree with Mike. I'm really happy to be here tonight and hopeful that we can provide some helpful information to students. And I think as we have all along, uh, just ask for support uh, from the community, from our students in terms of keeping one another well and safe. And I too, Ellie, I know we're going to turn it over to the students, want to thank the students who submitted questions uh, this evening. And we're brave enough uh, to be videoed uh, and ask those questions of us directly. So we're looking forward to getting started. Thank you. So we'll kick off tonight with our first question. Hi, my name is Summer Kirksick and I'm a sophomore in Walsh Hall. And my question is, why can't we have a few friends from other dorms in our rooms when we have indoor dining and we have lecture halls with more than 80 people? Thank you. Thank you, Summer. Thanks, Summer. Oh, Ellie, dude, I'll, I'll take that one if that's okay. Go ahead. Okay, uh, sounds great. And, and thanks to Summer for asking the question. I'll give maybe a short and then a, a more thorough answer to the question. Um, the capacity of, of who we're able to ask our students to invite into one another's rooms is actually limited by the space. So if you think about the university's overall health and safety protocols, wearing a mask uh, and then keeping our distance from one another as hard as that is really drives the capacity of our spaces. So we can have large classroom uh, interactions because we have those larger spaces and the residence hall rooms just don't allow for that same type of um, flexibility in terms of distancing from one another. But I do hope it's been well received uh, by students that we're trying really hard to make it possible for students to connect one, with one another, especially in this uh, time of cold weather. Uh, so we have uh, expanded some of the visitation options for students, most notably opening up uh, last week the 24 hour spaces uh, for students from other halls to visit one another. So I'm really grateful to students uh, for continuing to wear their masks as they can connect in those spaces, but we hope it provides more options to get together. Thank you, Erin, for that answer. I think definitely as students, we find a way to make the best of what we're given and we look for the best ways to, you know, like you said, keep connecting with one each other and building those relationships within the student body. Mike, would you like to add anything? No, I think I think Aaron nailed it. It's like, it's all about connectivity, right? And doing it the right way. Um, that's what we all want. Um, so I, I'm totally supportive and I think there's a lot of good potential there. Sounds good, definitely, I agree. Um, our we will transfer over to our next question. Hi, my name is Ellis Riojas. I'm a senior in Bomber Hall, 
And my question is, mindful of the importance of human connection, does Notre Dame support students who create close contact partnerships with significant others or another good friend? Or does it violate COVID protocol to come in contact with them? Furthermore, what about students who create small closed pods of friends with whom they're in close contact? Maybe I can start and then Mike, I'll turn it over to you to talk uh, a little bit more about close contacts. Uh, I think Ellis said it well, and it reiterates what we just said in the first question, which is, yes, we want students to connect with one another. If there is anything that I have been worried about as we start the spring semester in this relatively dark, snowy and cold time, it's actually isolation of students and making sure that you're finding ways uh, to connect with one another. What I think we're asking of students and of everyone uh, on the faculty and the staff and even our broader local community is to connect, but to do that a little bit differently. And that's using those health and safety protocols with the masks uh, and the distancing to avoid infecting others. And so uh, maybe Mike can add a little bit about how we think about close contacts and contact tracing. Yeah, I think I think that's well said, Erin. Um, and I appreciate Ellis's question as I'm just kind of running it through my head. I think regardless of it's your boyfriend or girlfriend or your small pod, however many people are in that, um, I certainly know I'm missing my friends, right? I'm missing connecting as, as we always have. But I think it's important and what we're hearing through contact tracing is if you're not doing the right things, I mean, it doesn't matter if there's one, two of you, four of you, six of you, if you're not wearing masks and if you're not distancing, the chances of getting, if somebody gets infected in that group, the chances of the others in that group, be it the other one person or whatever, the chances of them getting sick or, or catching the virus goes up. So here's one thing that we hear on contact tracing all the time. We hear about my girlfriend or my boyfriend or my buddy or my friend, we just went in a car to Target or to Meyer or to dinner um, somewhere. Maybe there were two of us, three of us, four of us. One of them gets sick and then immediately the rest of them become close contacts because they're not wearing masks in the car. And, and that's fine if you and your close pods are gonna make that decision to do that. You just need to know the risk of somebody getting, if someone gets sick, the rest of everybody being certainly a close contact, but the possibility of getting sick goes up. So, I mean, there's a trade-off there. And, and I think to Aaron's point, um, we want to be connected. We are, that's just human nature. And, and I want it, you want it, we all want it. But in the reality of COVID and in the reality of, where, reality of where we are now, it needs to look different. We can't outbox or outrun or outsmart the virus. It, it doesn't discern and it doesn't care who you are. It doesn't care who I am. Um, if you're not doing the right things when you're together, your chances of getting sick if someone else does goes up. And so um, I think the numbers that I was talking about on the, on the dashboard, they don't lie. And, and so we got to follow it and just understand that our actions have ramifications. And that's why I think you hear us over and over again. Um, I know it might not be the ideal situation, but we're just asking you to do it in a smart, you know, to connect with your friends and your, your, your pods and your close contacts and just be smart about it. Because like you, I just want us to be here for the rest of the semester and be healthy and, and make it the best semester possible. So yeah, this is a great question, Ellis. Yeah, thank you so much for that question, Ellis and Aaron and Mike for your responses. We will be moving on to our next question about our beautiful dining halls. Hello, I'm Peter Ross, a junior in St. Edwards Hall. My question is related to the dining halls. Uh, there's a line to swipe in and another line to get your food. It's taking about 40 minutes to get dinner. I'm curious as to what's being done about this because this was not a problem in the fall semester. Thanks, Peter. Uh, uh I'll address that one and uh, give all credit to our colleagues in campus dining. Uh, so Peter, I think actually highlighted something really important is we have seen a shift in the numbers of how students are choosing to eat compared to the fall and early in the spring semester. And it has shifted quite substantially toward the dining halls. And the second thing that's occurring, and again, this makes natural sense, is that students tend to linger longer uh, in the dining areas in all likelihood, I suspect, because of the cold. And so campus dining is adjusted in a few ways. Uh, they have opened a, some additional serving lines uh, and they have also uh, changed some of the, the wait lines and the queue lines so that students can be indoors while they're waiting. And I would, 
ask, and I know on behalf of my colleagues, if students are able uh, to move through those serving lines uh, as efficiently as they can, we want you to get the food uh, you want and you need, uh, but just be mindful of the fact that we're trying to adjust uh, to these higher capacity numbers. And uh, I know the team is working really hard to reduce any wait time that students are experiencing, uh, but still balancing those health and those capacity uh, controls that need to be there. Thank you, Aaron. We'll move on, unless Mike, you do have anything to add on this question about the dining halls? No, Aaron nailed it. I, I thanks for everyone's understanding and just watching out for one another there. Great, we'll move on to our next question about vaccination within the student body. My name is Owen Fay and I live in St. Edward's Hall. My question is that given that students who have tested positive in the last 90 days are exempted from both quarantine and isolation protocols and regular surveillance testing, then why can't a similar exemption be given for vaccinated students? After all, even though the science remains unclear on whether or not a vaccinated student could transmit the virus, the CDC maintains that that risk is low, similar to uh, a formerly positive person. As such, couldn't such a similar exemption be given to those of us who have been vaccinated? And if not, was there really a point to me having gotten the vaccine, given that it makes no discernible difference in my daily life as a student? Thank you. Okay, that Owen, that was one good question. There's a lot there. Um, maybe I'll, I'll start this, Aaron. Um, well, first let's talk on the testing part, Ellie. And we've heard this, the CDC says, if you've tested positive um, within the 90 days, there are, is some evidence that people can get reinfected after 90 days. Actually, there's some examples of a few people getting reinfected short of 90 days, but right, Right there, the CDC, it says, what we know about the virus right now is, is the 90-day mark. In terms of vaccine, which is, is really a good question, what, what we know about the vaccine now, and this is what the medical experts say from Dr. Mark Fox in the County Health Department, which I know many of our students know and across country, is that the vaccine prevents serious symptomatic disease, meaning that you're not going to get seriously ill if you've been vaccinated. It's still not clear yet if it prevents infection at all or if it prevents transmission. We're hopeful that that's what it's going to show over time. But I think until, until we get a little bit more time underneath us it's, or behind us, it's not clear yet. So although I might not have serious infection or a serious disease, as, as the medical experts would call it, I still don't know if it's preventing infection or if it's preventing me from trans, trans, um, transmission to others around me. So. Um, until we know that, regardless if you've been vaccinated or not, we are just going to stick with the clear mitigation strategies, masking, physical distancing, washing your hands, you name it. So until we know more about it, it's our hope. And I know it's Dr. Mark Fox's hope and, and our medical team's hope that and both at the local level, state level and national level, you put a couple more months behind us, we're going to know so much more about the vaccine. And it's our hope that we'll see that the transmission rates are going down the infection rates are going down. We're moving towards herd immunity as you know, as a society, and and things look much better for us. So um, that's a great question, Owen. I get it, but until we know more about it, we're going to protect one another. And and I apologize for the inconvenience, but at the same time, I don't, because I just we just want to watch out for everybody. And and we're just going to ask you to continue the same standards because. That's what's going to get us through this semester, and and that's what we're focused on. So I don't know, Aaron, if you want to add anything to that or not. No, I think Mike, you covered it really well. But I I think that last piece you highlighted uh, in terms of why even get vaccinated if we still need the mitigation strategies is that long game and that game for one another, which is. Uh, we're all hoping and really encouraging anyone who is eligible to get the vaccine so that we can build up that immunity uh, as a community overall, and then hopefully relax those uh, health and safety protocols in a day I know we are all longing and hoping comes as quickly as possible. But I would say that's worth it. I know that our students are by and large, though not every student is in a category uh, that's unlikely to uh, experience serious disease, that's a great blessing, uh, but there are many members of our community who might. And so our ability to take care of one another and protect one another from 
uh, transmitting or experiencing serious disease among any member of the Notre Dame community, I too think makes it worth it uh, and would really uh, encourage students when it becomes available to still get vaccinated. And, and Ellie, I'm good. I'll just add at the end of that, I think it's a very hopeful semester, right? I think there's a lot of things. The weather will only get better. It's got to get better, right? We are in the heart of winter this week. Um, so as we progress into March and April, the weather will get better. Um, it'll be easier to go outside. Uh, the vaccine distribution will only become more robust, we hope, across the country and throughout the state and even in our local community. And, and that will get closer to that herd immunity. In between now and then, we just we just will continue to stress to, to use the same mitigation and safety efforts. You know, do your daily health check, wear your mask, social distance, go to testing, all the things that we believe, be it now or April, will make us a healthier and safer community. We just got to double down on those. So uh, it, that that's just a great question, Owen. This, it's something that's on everybody's mind. So I really appreciate it. Of course, yep. Thank you, Owen, again, for your great question, and Mike and Erin, again, for a great response. I think as a student body, we have to be open to, uh, in a time of great uncertainty, listen to the experts and kind of learn what we have to do to best protect not just our community at Notre Dame, but also the South Bend and greater Indiana community as a whole. So we'll move on to our next question, which was asked by multiple students about gym appointments Hi, my name is Caroline McMullen and I'm a sophomore in PDUB. My question is, why have gym appointments been cut by 50% this semester, occurring in 30 minute intervals instead of 15 minute intervals like last semester? All of the appointments at a decent hour book up within a few minutes and at a time where physical health is so important to staying healthy during this crisis, is there any way to expand the offerings once again? I'll, I'll take that one. And uh, Ellie, I think you said uh, that Carolyn was one of many who asked this question and I'm so grateful. Actually, prior to this town hall, uh, our team in rec sports had heard the questions from students and I wanna share a couple of pieces of information. One is that actually the reservation start times did change from 15 minutes apart to 30 minutes apart, but that was actually a scheduling change and not um, a, a reduction of 50% in capacity. I could understand as students were looking at it, uh, how they might've perceived that. But regardless of that scheduling change, please know that the rec team has heard and been working really hard on addressing increased demand. As it turns out, uh, and again, you can blame the weather uh, or New Year's resolutions, as we often say, uh, the January and February timeframes uh, are always the busiest in our fitness centers. And so what the rec team has done over the last week or so is actually gone back uh, and re-looked again and is opening up more appointments. We're still operating within the very strict physical capacity constraints uh, and the cleaning constraints that are incredibly important uh, to offer our fitness facility safely. Uh, but in response to student feedback, please know that this was taken really seriously, is addressed. And I expect, uh, but certainly by the 22nd, uh, that students are going to start to see additional appointments available for them. I couldn't agree more that physical well-being is something I hope all of our students are attending well to. And I should also mention, in addition to using our indoor facilities, uh, that we're also going to try to find through programming some opportunities for students to enjoy the outdoors, maybe not in the frigid temperatures we're experiencing as much uh, this week, but uh, we're going to try to wait find ways to embrace winter. And the last thing I'll ask on the rec side is as we were studying this data and hearing from students about their difficulties in getting appointments, we did see a trend that I'm hoping I could ask for your help with. And that is that it appears that some individuals, uh, whether it's students, faculty, or staff are signing up for multiple appointments in the same day and not coming uh, and just picking the, perhaps picking one of those three. And so the help I would ask for from students and others in the ND community is please just uh, be mindful of others uh, who are trying to use those wonderful facilities that we have, sign up for one per day. And uh, if you aren't able to come, if you could please uh, let us know so that we don't have no-shows and space and machines go wasted. Thank you, Erin. I think also as our rec sports numbers increase, I would also like to thank um, individual dorm communities that have helped um, 
accommodate gym appointments in their in individual dorms, especially in PETA. Thank you for, uh, for that. I know it can be hard to uh, make exceptions, but also keep the physical distancing uh, rules alive. So thank you to all the individual dorms that have made adjustments to accommodate the students' wealth, I mean, health and well-being. Now we'll move on to our next questions about students and off campus. Hi, my name is Spencer Gouda. I'm a junior on the Notre Dame cheerleading team, and I used to live in Dunn Hall, but now I live off campus. My question for you is, are you concerned at the number of students who have moved off campus due to issues they have experienced with the university's COVID-19 regulations? If so, how do you think this reflects upon the success of these regulations? Thanks. Thanks, Spencer. I, I, I'll start with that, actually. Um, I remember very distinctly uh, the day as we were thinking uh, about reopening the university when Father John made the announcement last May about how to think about uh, how our students lived together during this most unusual year. And uh, the university thought it was incredibly important, uh, as, as do I and as did I, that actually students uh, were able to choose an option uh, this fall and this spring uh, that offered them what they felt was the most comfortable uh, situation. And so we were really happy uh, to offer that opportunity to students in June. And I must candidly say uh, that I was actually surprised. Um, we opened our residence halls in the fall uh, with uh, over 90% capacity uh, on campus. And so we were really happy, uh, both for the students who made good choices for them to go off campus and those who stayed uh, and thought that their best opportunity for a successful semester and a successful year here uh, was going to be on campus um, there. And so, as I think I mentioned earlier, uh, in response to the other question, uh, we've tried hard and Ellie thanks uh, to make things like fitness centers uh, available in the residence halls to allow students to safely use shared kitchen space, for example. But we also know that we have asked a great deal of both students on campus and students off campus in terms of adjusting to new protocols. And so I wanna thank everyone for their patience. Um, and hope that students have felt uh, the freedom this year to make uh, the choice that is best for them for their own particular living situation. Ellie, can I add something that uh, to the back end of that? Um, I, I appreciate the question, Spencer. It's great. It, I'll be quite candid and I'll just speak plainly. I don't care if it's on campus or off campus. I, I think when you look at the 29 positives, you know, we keep talking about that. It's undergrads, it's graduates, it's freshmen, it's seniors, it's on campus, it's off campus, it's men, it's women. So I think regardless if you're on campus or off, um, clearly the environment that we're finding ourselves in, it's mandating that we reinvent ourselves and how we do things. It's not what we're doing, it's how we're doing it. So I, I, that's something that keeps striking me is like, to Aaron's earlier point in rec sports or to you know the dining halls or just interacting in the small pods, like the earlier questions. Um, it, it's not telling us what we can do, it's, but it's mandating that how we go about our way. So again, I, I think if you live off campus or if you, or if you live on, it's the same health practices are gonna follow, should follow you everywhere. Because if you don't do it, the, the chances of getting sick or getting others sick will follow you. So, you know, I, I heard in the first semester, I heard from the students like, okay, this is an off-campus thing. It's an on-campus thing. It's just a thing. And so um, it's a great question. Um, and Aaron does a nice job laying it out that, you know, I think our, our students want to be in community here, but it's what we're doing, not, you know, it's not what we're doing, but it's how we're going about it that I think we just got to keep at the forefronts of our mind. Um, if we're going to get through this in good shape. So it's a great question, Spencer. I love it. Thank you, Mike and Aaron, for that transparent response. And thank you once again, Spencer, um, for that great question. We'll be moving on to our next question about policies and vaccination as the semester progresses. Hi, my name is Kate Laughlin, and I'm a 1L in the law school. My question is, what metrics are the university looking at in order to potentially re relax COVID policies as more and more people get vaccinated. Thanks. I think I'll, I'll take a crack at that. Thanks, Kate. Uh, the law school representing with a question. That's great. Um, 
the 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 metrics that we're going to look at to relax anything in the future are the same metrics that we would look in at. Do we have to tighten anything? It's basically the number of positive cases on campus on any given day and the positivity rate, which is that seven day average of where we're trending. Um, I think that that's why the dashboard, if you're not taking a look at it every day at noon, it updates from the day before. It just paints a picture and tells you how good or not things are going. And that, and again, it's just, it's just factual and that's the number. So we'll continue to look at those. And, and it's our hope you know, going to the earlier question of being a hopeful semester for all of us, that those numbers will get better as we go. Um, but the numbers will lead and tell us how we're doing. So anything that would warrant us relaxing anything or tightening, it's the same numbers. It's the positive rates and the infection rates. So I think that's where I would invite everybody to turn to and that will tell the story. Everything else will follow that. Thank you, Mike. Erin, would you, would you like to add something there? Maybe just one thing. I think Mike's exactly right about uh, as a community watching these numbers together. I, I would simply say, and Mike, you're really the expert on this more so than I, but I think to Kate's question of over the course of the semester, can we expect um, enough of our population to get vaccinated? I think all of you are, are aware uh, that the university has asked uh, the state uh, to be a distribution site, but that's a request uh, that not necessarily, and we won't hear for a while uh, whether or not it, that's going to be a possibility for us. But I think realistically, and Mike, you can speak to this, um, I'm not certain that we'll be looking in this spring semester to have enough of the proportion of our population vaccinated uh, for that alone to drive a change in many of our policies. And I think it's just really important we be transparent about that. We are waiting in line in the right way um, for the vaccine uh, to make sure that the populations uh, who are eligible first uh, get it and get it in time. We wanna be helpful, um, but uh, as I'm looking at the spring semester, especially with the age of our student population, I think it's probably unlikely that most of us will be vaccinated by the end of this spring. But Mike, you might want to provide some more detail. That, that's thank you, Aaron, because I totally missed that at the on that question. Um, you're you're right. So on the vaccination, this is the state health department, the Indiana State Health Department, and the CDC and the nation's. Um, this is their vaccination effort. So. Uh, that's the best comparator I could say is think in October when we have the flu blitz and the university is doing flu vaccines. We'll procure a certain number of vaccines and over a course of three, four or five days distribute it to the university community. This is theirs. Um, this is their vaccine clinic, clinic to run. So the supply chain is being dictated by the national demand and supply. Who gets it first? Right now, we know in Indiana, it's 65 and older is eligible to get a vaccine and sign up. So there's a lot of parameters that aren't ours that every university in the in the state and every community in the state needs to follow in conjunction with the local health department and the state health department. So, you know. Again, we're hopeful that more vaccines will be coming in the coming weeks and months and that that supply line will open up. But until it does, we know we will continue to follow the state's plan. Um, we have submitted a request to be a vaccination site if and when the time comes that that supply chain um, opens up. And, you know, our, it's hopeful that all of our students can get vaccinated sooner than later, but the supply chain and, and the demand across the state will dictate that. So. Here's keeping fingers crossed and, and looking forward to the future, but um, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Just hopefully it's not too far in the distant future. Thank you once again, Mike and Aaron, and thank you, Kate, for your great question. We know that students and everyone has really been waiting for this vaccine for a long time, and we, we appreciate that there are steps put in place to make that a possibility here on campus. Um, now we will move on to one of Notre Dame's top, Notre Dame students' top priorities, flex points. Hi, my name is Emily Wilborn and I am a junior in Howard Hall. My question is why did we receive 200 flex points, uh, extra flex points last semester, but not this semester, especially given the fact that Grubhub charges a service charge for every time that we get to use our Thanks, Emily. This is a, a, another one. I was really grateful uh, that we had a chance uh, to ask about this question. This is our uh, 
campus colleagues, and this may be a communication point. So let me give you uh, the 200 points were actually uh, communicated last fall for the academic year. But I want to assure students uh, that actually, even though that was uh, what we represented in the fall, uh, we also checked the data between the fall and the spring semester to really make sure that uh, it was working as we hoped and intended for students. And actually, the analysis really bore out uh, that most students had more than 50% of those additional flex points left. Uh, so we felt like the policy was still a good one. Uh, that we had put into place, but hopefully this can be a, a way for us uh, to just clarify that that was 200 extra points for this academic year. Thank you, Aaron. And Mike, would you like to add anything? I think Aaron nailed that. I, there's nothing I can add to it. Thanks, though. Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you, Emily, once again for your question. And we'll be moving on to our last question. Hi, my name is Brandon Conley. I'm a sophomore in Stanford Hall. And my question is, will we be able to attend outdoor sporting events in the spring, like baseball, softball, track and field, lacrosse, tennis, or any of our other Fighting Irish Athletics? I'll take that, Aaron. I love the mask, Brandon. I think that was his name. I love that. Um, so I, I would certainly hope that would be the case, that we could attend, have the students attend spring sports. I think you go back to the football model in the fall, right? Um, you're outside, you're wearing masks, you're physically distanced between roommates or sets of roommates. Um, I'm certain that we would want to look into that, seriously, talking with the athletics and everything. Um, but, you know, based on the capacities of the various stadiums, right, at the lacrosse stadium, the baseball, softball stadiums, stuff like that, keeping people physical distance and with masks. I do know that we wanted to see the first couple of weeks of the of the winter spring, well, spring semester, it just feels like winter right now, um, get a couple of weeks under our belt till we started talking about the, the spring sports in March and April. But um, I think if you use football as a model, it's a, it's a good concept to look at. We just want to see how the um, how the semester gets underway, and then we'll tackle it. But it's it's a great idea, and it's a great question. So um, again, fingers crossed, and and hope that can be certainly the case for everyone to cheer on their fellow student athletes, the student athletes. Thank you, Mike. Aaron, would you like to add anything to this last question? I think Mike got the answer, but I am looking forward to outdoor weather and uh, watching anything outside in a in a way that feels comfortable, but substantively, I think I'm as hopeful as Mike that there's some way with the appropriate distancing and protocols uh, that students can support one another in that way. Of course, looking forward to the sunnier days. <laughs> well, that brings us to the end of our question section. Thank you so much, and Aaron, Aaron and Mike for joining us and answering all the students' questions. Would you guys like to add anything as closing remarks before we end our first town hall? Uh, maybe I'll start and then uh, Mike, which is Ellie, thank you. It's, it's been a pleasure to meet you. And I, I want to reiterate again, thanks to the students who asked the questions. Um, and whether it is questions that we are able to answer today or ones that will come in the weeks ahead, uh, I hope students uh, will feel encouraged uh, and um, hear from us that we really do want to share information as transparently as we can. And the last thing I'll say in terms of thanks is actually simply thanks for your help. Uh, we know we're asking a lot. As Mike said, I think it is a hopeful time. Uh, I and I know all of my colleagues uh, are really excited to have students back with us again in person uh, this spring and we're hoping for a really successful semester, but we do need your help uh, with those health and safety protocols and remaining vigilant at a time I know um, it's been a long haul. Uh, and a lot has been asked of people over a long period of time, uh, but we are really invested in your education and your ability to connect with one another. And so thank you for hanging in there with us. Keep the suggestions and the questions coming. Yeah, and Ellie, I, I want to echo it. I just want to thank, thank the students for the quality of the questions. Um, I love the fact that you know I encourage you, just ask what's on your mind and we'll answer to the best of our ability. This whole COVID virus thing is a dynamic situation. It's fluid. It's constantly changing. So, as questions you know, come up, you know, pose them however you you want, and we'll be happy to answer them. Um, 
because the bottom line is we're in this together. Um, every faculty member in his or her classrooms, every staff member who is working tirelessly to, to pull this together, every student who is, who is just navigating these unprecedented times. I mean, let's be honest, collectively, we're writing the next chapter in Notre Dame's history. And this is gonna be a unique chapter to say the least. And I don't think that's a burden I don't think that's a curse. I think it's a flat out blessing that we all find ourselves here in this place at this time. So um, yeah, some days will be challenging and some days won't be fun, but if we do the right thing, the bottom line is we're doing it together. So, um, you know, so thank you for everything you guys are doing and, and, you know, keep a good attitude and let's just keep each other safe and healthy this semester. Of course, thank you so much once again, Mike and Aaron. And as you guys both said, it's great to be on campus. But if we've learned anything from this past year, it's that there's curveballs left and right. And we're looking forward to, through things like this town hall, be transparent between the student body and the administration to try to find the best ways to make this the most enjoyable semester for everyone, given the circumstances. Once again, thank you to all the students who submitted questions. And if you did not get your question answered tonight, no worries, there's more to come. So please make sure you um, Submit your questions at this link here, um, and we will see everyone next week for our second student town hall. Once again, thank you so much, Aaron and Mike, for joining us, and tune in next week to see what questions will be answered. Thank you, and have a good night.